It's good to see you this day. What a beautiful day. It's the second Sunday of Advent. We're glad that you are here to worship with us. We hope that if you're our guest, that you'll feel right at home and comfortable and be a part of all that we do. If you'll look at a few moments at the back of, uh, well, I, get, I, I want to say back of the worship bulletin, but that's not right. You see, I'm a creature of habit. If you'll look at the congregational concerns that were passed out, and we hope everybody does have an Advent booklet. Bruce Airwood is our Deacon of the Week. He'll be reading the Isaiah passage in just a little bit. The McGill Christmas Post Office is open, and you're invited to uh, share Christmas cards with our regular attending people. And uh, If you can see them, you can send them a card. That sound good? And that will go to ch- uh, Passport Missions. The youth are having a progressive dinner tonight. We'll see how that progresses. Um, Paul says... Uh, uh, there will probably be 30-some there, and so it's a wonderful thing, and we, we appreciate how. Uh, not only does our youth have progressive dinners, but we appreciate how they are progressing. And uh, in Sunday school this morning, uh, one of the parents of the youth, uh, there was that wonderful teaching moment, uh, and that youth uh, shared with uh, her parent uh, what the church was doing to help the poor. And I, I just was very touching that they had talked about that in youth and the, and the wonderful things that uh, uh, they felt a part of. And this speaks volumes, I think, to our, our youth program. Uh, joint speaking of uh, youth, the JOY, if you've ever wondered what that stands for, that's just older youth. And uh, that was the name they chose a long time ago. And if you've been around them, you understand how appropriate that is. If you're not old enough to be a part of it, you can come on out to their dinner uh, Thursday and you can be the mascots. And, uh, but they have a wonderful time. This is their Christmas lunch uh, this Thursday at 11. Barbecue? All right, that's going to be fun. Uh, the children will be presenting next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Welcome to the world, baby Jesus. So may, uh, the place will be full, so come on out and share that. You have the opportunity to pack a poke. The Christmas pokes on Christmas Eve, we begin packing at 10 o'clock. If you're here at 10.06, you're too late because that is the most efficient operation in the world. Right, Ernie? That's right. I mean, I don't know what union they belong, but they are fast. They are fast. And it's a lot of fun and a wonderful tradition at McGill uh, uh, pointing back to beyond the Depression. So please uh, come and help us that. Uh, all men and boys are invited to a fish fry. The ladies had a tea. The men are having a fry. So that sounds sort of appropriate. Uh, now usually when we, we do a dinner, we, we say, don't worry. We'll, we'll, uh, if we have soup, we can have water to the soup. But we can't add water to the fish. Uh, so we need an accurate account. So let Bruce Airwood know if you can come. That's Saturday, January 10th. And there is no UNCC basketball game that day, so that's already been taken care of. Uh, speaking of that, uh, Jamie texted me during the morning service, uh, early service, uh, this is still morning, uh, that we still need people to help on January, uh, December the 18th, the UNCC's Education Day. There's a morning game and a, a night game, so uh, please let Jamie know. This is the last day to bring coats, and Ben, uh, ben Phil will take them. And they're being distributed, and we appreciate the work of the Cabarrus Partnership for Children. What a wonderful partner they are of ours. Uh, 2015 budgets and descriptions are in the back in November financials. Uh, Wednesday night, this is the last Wednesday night supper. It's going to be vegetable soup, salad, fruit, dessert. Uh, Sign up this Wednesday. Anything else? I forgot anything. Steve. I'd just like to thank everyone for all the thoughts and the prayers and the cards uh, at the death of my mom, and uh, I really do appreciate that. The church has been so kind and so caring, and uh, you've been very proud of the Reverend Dr. Ayers who officiated at the service. He just did a wonderful job. And because I've been gone, I haven't had a chance to teach you this congregational Advent song, Drawing Nearer, so... Rather than try to ad-lib that today, I'll sing something else and teach it to you next week. All right, thank you. He's a good professor. His mother was a wonderful lady. She, uh, uh, I had the opportunity, as you well know, to be her pastor years ago, and she just, uh, uh, 
she, uh, one of the stories Steve let me tell, she did, never had a driver's license. Uh, she, saw, she drove and her, uh, Steve's dad says, you can't drive without a license. But she wouldn't get a license uh, because she said it was nobody's business to know her age and her weight. <laughs> she was a neat person. Let's stand and greet each other. Good morning and welcome to the December 7th worship service here at McGill Baptist Church, our second Sunday in Advent. This morning our pastor Steve Ayers will be preaching a sermon, The Beginning of the Good News, which comes from Mark uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Our beginning of the week, we'll be delivering our Old Testament lesson and our morning prayer, which will be Bruce Airwood. Now go back to worship, and again, welcome. Y'all did pretty good there. That was really good. And I'm really proud of Maddie. She's been working very hard in her guitar. And we're going to hear some more from our guitar ensembles a little later on. Let's join in singing the first hymn, Angels from the Realms of Glory, hymn number 94. Would you stand as we sing, please? Thank you. 
As we gather for the second Sunday of Advent, if you'll join me in reading responsively our call to worship. Voices cry out from the wilderness. This peace not may not be easy if it means that mountains will come crashing down and rough places will be ground to dust to make a way. Gathering exiles in his arms, carrying them home in her bosom. Today, on this second Sunday of Advent, we light a candle of peace as a sign of the approaching sunrise a reminder that we are called to prepare the way for peace. And though the way of peace may be hard, peace itself is coming toward us. God comes with might and with an outstretched arm reaching up helplessly from a manger. Amen. Welcome to this second Sunday of Advent as we worship our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reading this morning, as always, from the New Revised Standard Version, verses Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. A voice cries, a voice says, cry out, and I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get ye up to a high mountain, O Zion. Herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, Herald of good tidings, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father, it is our honor to be here in this, your house. We come as people who profess our sins, who believe in your glory, and are thankful for this time of year that is the blessing that we have received of your Son. Our Father, in this house we learn In this house, we become friends. In this house, we learn how to become a Christian. And our Father, you have blessed us in so many different ways. Our Father, as we come before you this season, may we realize how important in each of our lives is your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you have blessed us. With your son, he has shown us 
what to do. He has shown us what to say. And our Father, may our hearts and our minds be open and receptive of his word. At this time, we pray for those who are hurting in some way. We pray for those who are healing. We pray for healing. We pray for doctors and for nurses who bring forth healing. But our Father, we pray that our hearts will be healed, that we will become loving people. We will become people who reach out and show caring and love for those who may be unloving. Our Father, this time of year, we thank you for everything that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for this church and for what it does and for how it reaches out into the community. And we pray our lives will be touched and our lives will be like a star on the hill. Forgive us of our sins. Show us the way to live. For all these things we do pray. Amen. Our children will come forward and meet Paul and Lizzie on the steps. Good morning. How are y'all today? I have a question I want to ask Lindsay. Okay. When you have good news, how do you tell people about that good news? Well, I would probably text them or maybe I'd call them. I don't know. Um, probably Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Twitter. Anything else? Nah. Okay. You know, we communicate electronically these days. But a long time ago, they used to communicate or talk to people in different ways. One thing is they talk, right? Hmm. Imagine mm -hmm. that. They would actually talk to people. You know, one of the things they did a long, long time ago, before there were telephones or electronic devices, a guy would ring a bell and go, hear ye, hear ye. And then everybody would stop and listen to what he had to say. A long time before that, there was a prophet by the name of Isaiah. And Isaiah said that there was somebody coming that was going to be a messenger and was going to share some good news. And that good news turned out to be Jesus. Now, here at Christmas, who are some messengers that tell others about Jesus? You know of any? Hmm. Can you think of any? Look over there, see if you can, any hints? Look at the manger. Angels, God. Anybody else? Sheep? The sheep. Okay, that was the shepherds. Yes, yes. very good. Anybody else? Who else? The angels. The wise men, right? They all were messengers of God to tell the good news. There was also another man. Later on, his name was John the Baptist. And he also told people that Jesus was coming. That he had a great message. Now, the neat thing about this is they're not the only ones, the people you named are not the only ones that can share the message of, of Christmas. You know who else can? Do you know who else can? Who? You can. You can share the message of Christmas and of Jesus, that God sent his son, Jesus. So not only the angels and the shepherds and the wise men and God and John the Baptist can be a messenger to tell about Jesus, but you can too. Lindsay, would you pray for us? I would. Will you pray after me? Dear God, help us to be your messengers and spread the good news. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 89, O Come All Ye Faithful. Let's stand again, please, as we sing hymn 89.
One of the great challenges in the world today is that one in eight people are hungry. That's 842 million people. That's a staggering statistic. It's really hard to get our heads around. But as a people uh, who are given at least two gifts in the world by Jesus, one, baptism, literally the raising of people to new life from the dead, and second, feeding them a meal, the Eucharist, communion, the Lord's Supper, that a meal would be one of the two gifts that Jesus bequeathed the church strikes me as a, a wonderful calling and opportunity for cooperative Baptists to live into feeding the world. Christ fed the hungry. Christ lived in the community. For churches to understand hunger and hunger-related issues, they need to first of all be involved. Actually go to the people in the streets in their homes and experience the hunger that people have and the poverty that people have that causes the hunger-related issues. Coming alongside people that are hungry is a spiritual journey. When we think that we can solve a problem with a checkbook or we can eradicate hunger through a scheme of some sort, I think we're buying into something that isn't scriptural because to end hunger is to begin living together with other people. I often see this perception that when we see the poor, we only see their need. We don't see that they are people like you and me. You know, they get up every morning. They want to have breakfast every morning. They have ideas of what they want to do. When Jesus saw the crowds and he realized they were hungry, he felt compassion. And unfortunately for a lot of us, when we see hungry people, our immediate response is not compassion. We get frustrated. We don't know what to do about it. If we can find compassion, then that will lead us into uh, finding better solutions to hunger all around the world. The best thing about hunger, maybe the only good thing about hunger, is that it has a clear and definite cure. The cure for hunger is food. And every CBF congregation, every partner, every church, has all the things it already needs to tackle hunger. You have a space where you can welcome people in, and you can find food in pretty much any grocery store in the world. There is a distribution problem here. There's a fairness issue. There is a justice issue here. God doesn't turn his back on those that are suffering from injustice and poverty and hunger. We are invited to the banquet table. There's enough for everyone. Let's have a mentality of abundance, not of scarcity. I think the church is the first place where people should care for others. And meals are important in getting together. You get to know people better. It encourages the spirit of uh, friendship. It encourages the spirit of uh, fellowship. Instead of creating more soup kitchens, what if we created more feasts? What if we threw fantastic feasts? What if we were known as people who knew how to welcome in the hungry? Constantly, Jesus was revealing himself in the breaking of bread. That's where Jesus shows up in our world even today, just as he did in the world of Scripture. There's plenty of food. If the Spirit of God is opening our eyes to anything, it is to the disparity between those who have and those who don't have. We have every tool we need to end hunger. For God so loved the world. That should be our platform to end hunger. Peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. This Christmas, pray for Ministry of Barcelona among the international. Remember the Prince of Peace, Jesus, and invite him into their lives.
May we pray together. Father, as we continue to worship, we come acknowledging that all that we are and all that we have is your gift to us. May we worship by returning our tithes, our offerings, and the dedication of our lives and abilities and talents to use to show your love to others. Take all that is given and use it in a way that will bring others to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.
Now Pastor Steve Ayers with the morning message. Thank you, ever so beautiful. Our New Testament reading comes from Mark, Mark 1, verses 1 through 8. First verses of the first gospel. I do read from the, good, from the New Revised Standard. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were coming out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. And may we know this way how we prepare our lives for the Lord's coming. May we pray. Our Father, we thank you this day that we can come together. We thank you for the joy that we find in this place. We thank you that the work that we can do together. And we pray thy blessings upon the food that has been brought today for distribution among the poor. We pray thy blessings upon the work that continues to be done. We're thankful for the work that you have given us. We're thankful that we can share together in your love. We're thankful that we can be a community of faith with our arms reaching out. We're thankful that your grace touches our lives. We pray for our world. We have lit the candle of peace, and we know full well that there is little peace in our world. We pray that we will be peacemakers. We pray that in some way we would embody the things that you would have us to do and to say and to be. We pray that we would go that extra mile. We pray that we would be like you. We continue to remember those that are sick, those that are grieving, those who are heavy in heart. We know that you come and comfort them and that you call us to wholeness. We pray for the wholeness in our lives. Help us, dear Lord, to know these things. And we remember now even how you once taught us to pray and we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In life, we are faced with a lot of questions. In fact, one of our Sunday school classes recently did a series called Living the Questions. As you think of all those questions, I, I was sort of considering Two of the most inane questions that I know. One happens in summer and one happens now. In summer, somebody will come up to you and they'll say, is it hot enough for you? No, it's not hot enough for me. I'd rather it be 115 degrees. You know, what, how do you respond to that? Is it hot enough for you? Well, no. And right now, what's the question everybody asks? They come up and say, are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready for Christmas? No, I'm not ready for Christmas. When we ring the bell, the fireman's bell, uh, at midnight on Christmas Eve, I'll be ready. Until then, I'm not ready. How do we prepare our hearts, our lives, who we are for Christmas? How do we prepare our world for Christmas? Now, some of that's fairly easy. We say, well, we can light the tree. 
we can put all the, all, all the lights on our house. And uh, Some of you have a lot of lights, by the way. Uh, that's not a, I'm not complaining. I'm just observant. You can put the reefs out. You can put this out. You can put that out. You can make everything look picture perfect. Uh, everything looks like, because we're in the south, a house out of southern living. You know, everything is wonderful. And then can we say, are you ready for Christmas? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's what it means. There's more to be ready for Christmas than the way our houses look, the way we decorate. It's a strange way the gospel of Mark begins. Mark is the first gospel. It's the first gospel that was ever written. It was a gospel that was written after the fall of the temple. It was written at a time of great chaos. And it doesn't begin with any of the birth narratives. It begins with John the Baptist. Now, I... You know, we're sending out Christmas cards right now. I bet not one of you has sent out a Christmas card with John the Baptist's picture on it. He doesn't make the cards. But Mark begins his gospel of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a voice crying out in the wilderness. And he evokes images from the prophet Isaiah. That wonderful passage that Bruce read in Isaiah comes at a time the people had been in Babylon. They had been in Babylon for 50 years. They had been exiled. They had been uprooted from their country. They had become refugees. They had been uh, taken against their will. And there for 50 long years they had lived. They had had children in Babylon. They had learned to sing like the caged bird. They had learned to do the things that they had to do by the waters of Babylon. They had started a new life. And now Cyrus had become the emperor there, and he says, you can go back. Some of them didn't know what they're talking about. And, the, and Isaiah says to the people, we need to go back. God has a message and a purpose and a task. You need to go back. You need to cross the desert. You need to go back. And you need to build a new city. You, you need to make the highway long and wide and safe. You need to go back and see and do and be. And the voice in that passage says, what do you mean? We're people, we're, we're like the flower that fades, the grass that withers, we will die. But the Word of God is more than that. The Word of God calls us to be more than we are as individuals. It calls us to be something collectively. The Word of God says you go and have a vision. You go and build the things that you need to build. You go build a future. And so they moved. They went back. They crossed the desert. They built a a new city, a new beginning, a new place, a new Jerusalem. And now, many, 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 you get the idea, years later. There's another voice. It is the voice of John the baptizer. He is preaching out in the wilderness. And the people are coming to him. Now, John is a striking figure. He's way ahead of his time. He he dresses in camel's coat, camel's hair. I mean, that's a nice top coat, is it not? It's pretty expensive too. Nah, that's, he's, not a, he's not a fashion whatever you call those things. He's out there and, and it's interesting that Mark, Mark is very strict with words. He's very tight with words. But he lets us know that uh, John uh, has a camel's hair coat about him and he eats locusts and wild honey. He's a striking and he's speaking out and he's saying something. He's saying as we read this scripture, he's saying, you know, he didn't go to seminary. He didn't take that course uh, in the public practice called how, uh, Andrew Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. John didn't make that one. So he goes, and what is his message? He says, oh, you vipers, you sons of snakes, you sons of vipers. Who do you think you are? You who wear your religion on your sleeve. You who think you're so self-righteous. You who think you got it coming. You who think you have it made. You who are so righteous. He said, no, you see, you, you, you didn't send a Christmas card out that said you sons of snakes, did you? And inside it wouldn't say ho, ho, ho. It said hiss, hiss, hiss. But this is what John was saying, and he was saying it to shake things up. He was saying because he had a message. And what is the message? He says... That preparing your hearts for the Lord begins with one thing. Repentance. Now I think sometimes we have the wrong idea about repentance. 
We think that we can confess or recite a litany of wrongs, a litany of sins. And if you're going through your mind everything you've done wrong right now, don't let me stop you. No. Trust me, you're not going to remember them all. But you're missing the point. You're missing the point. Repentance isn't just saying all those things and then say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, sometimes I'm sorry just doesn't get it. It just doesn't work. That's not the point. That's interesting that you need to acknowledge that in some things in your life you've done wrong. We all have. But repentance is far deeper, far broader, and far more important than that. Anyway, we're more concerned with somebody else's sin. We're more concerned about what somebody else is doing. We're more concerned about why somebody else is wrong than what we are and how we are. But that's not the point either. The point is we repent, we turn toward God. That's all it means. We turn our hearts, we turn our lives in the right direction. Now, our lives are going many places and many places today. We're all at loss. And the question that we have from the gospel is where are we going? Where are we heading? Where is your life pointing you today? Where do you think it's going to end up? What are you following? Where are you planning to be? That's the question. If we repent, we're turning toward God. If we repent, we're saying that the things that God has shown us is important are the things that we think are important. And what are those things? To condemn everybody that we meet? To tell everybody else how wrong they are? To point the finger and say, ha ha, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm making it to heaven, and you know where you can go. No, that's not what that means at all. When we repent, we turn our hearts and our lives to God, and we go in the direction He would have us. Then we go, and we find the poor, and we feed them. Then we go, and we do the things that are right, and true, and just, and pure. pure. Then we do with a heart of loving, and giving, and caring. Then we go, and we be as much like Jesus as we can. Are we going to do that every day of our lives? I don't know. Are we going to take the wrong turn sometimes? I think so. Are we going to be perfect little tin angels that we can put on a Christmas tree? No. We're human. But the most important thing is our lives are pointed in the right direction. And as far as we go astray, then that love of God and that star and that light that God calls us will show us the right way. That's the meaning of the star. It points us to where God wants us to be. The light of the world. The love of the world, the truth of the world, the things that are right. We repent, we turn toward them and live toward them and do something about it. You can say, I'm sorry, all you want. But until you point your life in the right direction, that's all that's going to matter. Where is your life taking you? Where are you heading? What direction are you going? Is the love of God, is the mercy of God, is the joy of God calling you? I think so. I know so. Open your heart to who he is. Open your world to his world and follow him. Repent. The kingdom of God is not tomorrow. The kingdom of God is not next year. The kingdom of God is now and is breaking into your life. Follow the star. Follow your Lord. May we pray. Our Father, how grateful and thankful we are to be here in this place. We repent. We know in so many ways that we have failed. And yet we know that we can turn our lives to you. To your grace and to your love. And that that love will draw us. That love will guide us. That love will never fail us. And so we place our trust. We place our life. We place who we are with you. And we pray this day that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to feel. 
and that our lives will be turned to you. For as we turn our life to you, we turn our life to each other and to the world that you have loved. We pray in the name of the one who came to show us the way. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our hymn is a hymn of invitation. As we sing it, we invite you to know, first of all, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the one, and he calls us to a different kind of life. He calls us to be like him. He calls us to repent. We invite you to become a part of our fellowship, our membership here at McGill, that we may work together in the community of faith to do the very things that he would have us to do. However God would lead you, we invite you to step forward as we stand and sing hymn number 90, Carols Sing. We're so glad that you've been part of our service this day. We appreciate so much the guitars, the chimes, the handbells, and what a wonderful season Christmas is. We have several concerts today, and Lindsay's going to be in a concert with the community choir at Forest Hills at 4 o'clock. Steve's in a concert at Pfeiffer at 4 o'clock, and you can't be in two places at one time, but, you know, try. And then next Sunday evening, the children's program will be at 6, so it's a good time. Interesting, I, I thought you caught the, the great symbolism of the uh, last Sunday night. Uh, Melinda and Jason lit the candle of hope. And today, uh, Courtney and Philip lit the candle of peace because they've, they, they're getting a new baby real soon. And uh, they've got a new baby, and, and they pray for peace every night. <laughs> so I thought that was very poetic. And uh, what a joy, uh, what a joy our children bring to us. Remember all the activities, indeed, of this week. It is a good week. It's a good day. And now we go into the world, the world that God has so loved, a world in which he will give you direction if you will but follow him. And you will go in many different directions. You'll go north, east, south. You'll go everywhere. But as you go, the love of God will go with you. And as you go... The love of God will show you where you need to be. And as you turn toward him, you will look at others in a different way. And you will see yourself and you will see Jesus. And that is Christmas. So go and celebrate the season with all your heart and all that you are. In the name of the Father who loves us all 
In the name of the Son, who is love incarnate, and in the name of the Spirit, that is love even now. We go. Thank you for joining us for our D- December 7th worship service here at McGill Baptist Church, our second Sunday in Advent. McGill Baptist Church is at 5300 Popper Tent Road in Concord, North Carolina. Our phone number is 704-788-1180, and our website address is www.mcgillbaptist.org. Thank you again for joining us, and again, have a blessed day.